John Wise, with this information of this current, went to Congress for funding for $15,000 so he could study and prove that it would be good for travel. But the only thing he got was laughter. Wise realized there was only one way to prove his findings could be useful. His idea, to make a balloon trip halfway across America. Then hopefully with that, he could get the right amount of funds to travel to Europe. Another balloonist decided to tag along with Wise in this endeavor, named John LeMountain, 29 years old, from Troy, New York, who actually put together the balloon for the voyage through the direction of Wise. O.A. Geiger, a Vermont businessman, funded the trip and also came for the voyage. Lastly, an aged reporter named Mr. Hyde from the local newspaper in St. Louis, Missouri. When the balloon was done, all of the four men looked at the balloon, being 50 feet in diameter and a whopping 60 feet high. They all christened the name of the balloon to be the Atlantic. They thought it was a prophecy in the making, since the Atlantic Ocean was the next thing for the balloonists to conquer. The voyage would start in St. Louis, Missouri. July 1st, 1859 came along. The, the balloon was to make 809 miles with the jet stream that John Wise founded. Trying to convince more people it could be used for travel, then use a balloon to cross the Atlantic Ocean to Europe. At the time, it was considered to be one of the longest air balloon voyages ever made. Along with the longest air balloon scientific tests, Wise would go on to make tests on the trade winds to see when it would be perfect to launch the balloon for the voyage. Six o'clock in the evening, the party gathered around into the craft and got set to launch. With thousands of pounds of sand ballast to use, along with food supplies such as water, lemonade, wine, and well-cooked game meat. A boat was tied to the balloon and would come on their journey, a light yet well-crafted one, where Geiger and LeMountain, as well as Mr. Hyde, would stay during the flight, tied by rope 15 feet from the balloon's wicker basket. Around 6.45, the balloon was cut loose to the air to start their journey and the greatest balloon voyage ever. The ascent was peaceful and easy, the balloon moving off in an easterly direction. The cheers of the audience inside and outside of the arena were of the heartiest kind. We responded with a parting farewell and a lingering look upon the thousands of upturned faces that cheered us onward. As the balloon got higher, they reached around 8,000 feet at 55 miles an hour. As the cold and dark blanket of the night came to them, and the moon giving them the only light they had, Wise decided to check the bearing of the balloon and noticed that it wasn't correctly together. Only six ropes were holding the balloon and cutting rather than pressing against the balloon. John Wise, noticing this, knew that he had a race against time to fix it. So he put his head over the wicker basket and called for Geiger to come up and help him as quickly as he could. After about half an hour, they managed to get all 36 ropes tied correctly. Geiger went back down to the boat, and the balloon sailed on through the night. The feeble shimmer of the new moon was now mantling the earth beneath in a mellow light, and the western horizon was painted with gold and purple. 
Nothing could exceed the solemn grandeur of the scene. All was as quiet and still as death, and not a word was passing from the lips of the crew. Every one seemed to be impressed with the profound silence that hung around us. The coy-looking moon was lowering itself into the golden billows of the Occident, and the greater stars began to peep through the curtains of the vasty deep one by one. Still silence reigned supreme. It seemed as though all nature had gone to sleep with the setting of the moon and the stars were coming out on the watch hours of the night. In another moment, the stillness was broken. Cattle began to low and some loud mouth dogs greeted our ears with an occasional bark. This seemed to break the silence of the crew and soon a lively conversation ensued. We also amused ourselves by uttering an occasional shout which set the dogs below to barking far and near. During the day and while the balloon was being inflated, the sun was pouring down upon a flood of heat and light. Although it is a proverb but that you cannot carry light in a bag, it will be learned that this ancient saying found its contradiction in our gas bag. It did carry up with its heat and light, and during the whole night it was illuminated with a brightness equal to a Chinese paper lantern. It served a good purpose as it enabled us to note the time with our watches. It appeared indeed truly wonderful, and the first impression made was that it might be an incipient combustion, and that soon it might be our lot to pass into eternity like a blazing meteor. The phenomenon was so remarkable that the mind was not at first capable of finding a satisfactory reason for its appearance. However, the conclusion finally arrived at was that it must be a combination of heat, light, and carbureted hydrogen, and inasmuch as it had been going on for several hours, it was not likely to get hotter in the upper air. So we satisfied ourselves that there was no imminent danger from a conflagration while aloft. This phenomenon is sometimes to be seen in the slightly illuminated clouds on a hot summer night. In the balloon, it was unique. Every seam and every mesh in the network could be traced upon its surface. Even the atmosphere around and beneath us seemed to partake of this mellow light. Woods, roads, prairies, streams, and towns were discernible, and their outlines could clearly be traced at our greatest elevation. Nothing could surpass the novelty of the scenery below during the early part of the night. The heavens above were brilliantly studded with stars of every magnitude and color, the atmosphere having become perfectly clear, and when we crossed water we had the starry heavens as distinctly visible below as above. We could at such times easily imagine ourselves sailing in the very center of the star region as the opaque earth seemed then out of the question. These reflected star fields were of short duration, but vanished only to make room for that weird appearance which the earth presented. One could not immediately see the surface outline below, but keeping the eye steadily fixed downward, it gradually developed itself to the vision until every different shape and object became defined though in a most ghost-like light. The forest appeared of a deep brown cast, and when a handful of sand was dropped overboard at our greatest elevation, it could be distinctly heard raining upon the foliage of the trees. It answered as an index for our altitude in accordance with the time that elapsed between the discharge of the sand and the noise of its contact with the trees. As the crew and the balloon went on, every time they passed areas with population, they would scream out to see if anyone would call back. Yet the only response was the echo of their shouts. The reverb and the echo went for miles, differing as it were on land. The next day seemed very warm and calm, and John Wise being up all night and tending to the balloon often, decided it was time to take a nap. So he took several blankets and decided to wrap himself in them to get some rest. He thought that the balloon would be alright since the gas hose was tied safely and the balloon was filled up and the valve left enough out to keep them at a good distance in the air. He told the rest of the crew what to do while he napped, and told them to keep in an easterly direction, which then sand ballast was liberally used up while he was asleep, because the crew thought it was the right decision, yet resulted in the diminishing density of the air, which caused the hose to drop and start blowing the gas into Wise's mouth and nostrils while he slept, poisoning him into an even deeper sleep. Mr. Gager got concerned of the flight since the balloon was drastically changing in height, shouted to Wise to see what was going on or what they could do to help, but received no answer. Gager decided after three or four times of calling Wise, he would go up and check on him. When looking over the basket to see John Wise was sleeping heavily and breathing hard, Seeing that the hose was sending gas into his body, 
So he went to say Wise, and Wise noted, Lucky it was for me that he was so watchful and considerate for a few minutes more would have ended my existence from the copious overflow of gas that had ensued. Giger removed the hose from his face and propped his head up, and after a few minutes of getting the necessary fresh air he needed, he came to consciousness. John coming back started to have a lot of hallucinations from the gas being in his body for too long, describing that he felt like he fell asleep for years. Having a dream where he went diving with a diving bell and having interplanetary balloon adventures, he got himself together and grabbed the ropes of the balloon to start fixing their position, ordered Gager to go back down to the boat and for all the men to take a nap if they so pleased. And the flight went on smoothly for a while. Sailing at an altitude of 10,000 feet contracted our area of visible surface below so much that we thought it would be more interesting if we should lower the airship to within a thousand feet or less of the water surface. So down we came until we nearly touched the waves. Overhauling a steamboat that was moving in the same direction with us, we struck up a conversation. The steam whistle was sounded, the boat bell rung, and a speaking trumpet conversation ensued. How do you do, Captain? A fine morning for boating. The captain immediately responded, Good morning, my brave fellows, but where in the heavens did you come from or from St. Louis, sir, last evening? And pray, where are you going? We're going eastward, Captain, and first to Buffalo, and then to Europe if we can. Good luck to you, said the captain. You are going like thunder. They had reached as far as Niagara Falls and saw very many things along the way but their voyage would turn for the worst. A storm brewed up and they went straight into it, trying to figure out a way to land safely. Yet, there was no way to land. They tried to get down onto a shore, but rebounded off and went into a tree, which Wise deemed it like hooking into the Leviathan itself, not being able to move the balloon at all. Then, all of a sudden, the balloon broke free stomping atop the tree line like a raging elephant, ending up to be hanging from another tree with the boat still hanging on by the three ropes. Eventually they were noticed by the locals of the township in the area of Henderson, Jefferson County, New York. They brought them back to town and gave them dinner to let them rest. Wise then got ready and made the announcement that the balloon trip was over and was unsuccessful. Despite it being a failure, it still showed that the Eastern jet stream worked very well, but didn't convince Congress to send him across the Atlantic Ocean, but with the events that happened and his adventure with it, was dubbed one of the greatest balloon voyages ever.